Okay, Michael Marshall is going to give us a little introduction to mini body perturbation theory. All right, so this is a continuation of our summer lecture series into the advanced lecture series. I'm going to start off with a not so advanced topic on uh, mini body perturbation theory. Uh, like I said, Michael Marshall, third year of Dr. Shell's group. So, what we're going to talk about today um, is kind of why we needed mini body perturbation theory. Um, I'm going to start off with the basics. So I'm going to start with uh, Raleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory and an application to anharmonic oscillators. And then I'm going to move into how we take Raleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory and develop more plastic perturbation theory with some constraints. Um, then I'm going to kind of show you what we can do with it, some of the applications, what it corrects, and then follow into where its limitations are, how quickly we get to those limitations. Um, so, so far in this lecture series, you all have learned everything from Hartree Fock to configuration interaction. Each of these are great in their own respect, but they also fell for a lot of things. Uh, so Hartree Fock, as we saw, um, does a great job, but it doesn't account for dynamic electron correlation. So we're never going to be able to get things like Van der Waals interactions or any time where we need you know, instantaneous uh, electron electron interaction. Because with Hartree Fock, you know, averages it out. Um, to get dispersion, you can't do this averaging. This functional theory kind of does this. Um, it does some dynamic electron correlation, but it doesn't include uh, long range stuff. So still, you don't get the Bender walls interactions, but you do get nice energies for other systems. Uh, the other bad thing about this functional theory is technically there's no systematic way to improve the results. So if I go to a bigger basis set, I don't necessarily get a better answer. And so that's, that's one of the other flaws of this functional theory. Technically, you could climb the rungs. So DFT has these quote unquote rungs of DFT where you go from pure DFT all the way to these meta GGAs that start to look MP2 like. But, you know, the actual size of how far this lateral gets you varies a lot for your potential application. So, <clears throat> a couple cluster theory. Um, the problem with it is the serious scaling. Um, I mean, you hit a brick wall. And the uh, CCSD itself, even when truncated to doubles, is end of the six. And when you do triples, it's, uh, you're down to just a handful of atoms you can apply this to. Uh, configuration interaction, again, I mean, it scales so poorly they put uh, an exclamation point in it. <laughs> um, and then CISD, um, I mean, it scales all right for uh, uh, truncated, but once you truncate it, it loses a lot of nice properties like size extensivity and whatnot. So there's a nice little niche right here um, for a, a level of theory that scales into the fifth. So we're not into the you know the scaling of a couple cluster yet, but we're not we're not in the end of the fourth of uh, Hartree Fock or DFT. But we needed a theory that scaled somewhere around the end of the fifth or better that accounted for these long range dynamic electron correlation and also has the ability to be improved upon. So we can you know, increase the basis set, get a slightly better answer, or we can do CBS extrapolations, which you learned from Lori's talk, get even better answers. So this is the level of theory that we're going to talk about today, uh, mini body perturbation theory. And where we're going to start is with um, the generic version, which is called raleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory. And the way we're going to introduce this to you all is through uh, an application to anharmonic oscillators. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this problem, and we're going to we're going to break it up into two parts. Um, we we have this Hamiltonian that looks rather complicated, right? And we still need to solve H i e set for this problem. But uh, let's just say for sake we, we can't solve this. We don't know how to solve this Hamiltonian. What we can do is we can break it into two parts. We can break it into a part that we know how to solve. We've been solving the harmonic oscillator for quite some time, which is outlined as the, the dotted line. Um, and then we can add this other part that we don't know how to deal with very well uh, as a completely separate part. And then we can redefine our Hamiltonian such that we have uh, the unperturbed Hamiltonian, i.e. the one that we know how to solve, plus some kind of perturbation. This perturbation, we're going to call this the, the other bit, so we don't know how to solve this other little thing. Um, and we also introduce a parameter called lambda that lets us transition from an unperturbed to a fully perturbed uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, as you can see, if, if lambda were zero, you get back to the harmonic case. When this is fully perturbed, you're at the, the Hamiltonian that we want to. We just have to have this lambda to, to you know, smoothly get from one to the other. So some of the basics are, um, let's go ahead and just plug in for um, our new Hamiltonian. And we still need to solve you know, h psi e psi. But we got to remember that when we introduce this perturbation, our wave function now depends on lambda. So it's going to depend on how much of that perturbation that we introduce. Same goes for the energy levels. I mean, as we introduce a bigger perturbation, we should change our energy levels. Um, and then, so now we have this, 
wave function that depends on lambda, we have this energy that depends on lambda, and we don't know how to solve. So what do we do with functions that we don't know how to solve? We expand them in Taylor series. Common trick from mathematics and physics, been using it for years. What we do is we're gonna expand around lambda zero out to an infinite series. Typically when you do this, you just hope that the series converges very quickly and you don't need the whole series. And we're gonna see if, and, uh, if, if it actually does that and what happens when it doesn't. Uh, but, so we have, these, we have these infinite series, or Taylor expansions, for the wave function and the energy. Uh, some common no the notation, we're just going to simplify some stuff. So the kth order wave function, so you can have all these uh, first order corrective wave functions, second order corrective wave functions, and we're just going to define them as such, uh, as you just saw from the Taylor series expansion, uh, to make the notation a little easier. So you can see that the, the full wave function, and the raleigh schroeder perturbation theory, uh, I'll leave this as in, you know, we typically apply it to ground states, but it can work for excited states. It, it, it doesn't uh, really matter. Um, but right now, so we're left with this uh, Taylor series for psi, and we're gonna see it's the reference plus all these various perturbed wave functions with lambdas out in front of them. Same thing for energy. So let's plug that back into our H psi psi. You can see what we get. <clears throat> so plugging back in, uh, we see our new Hamiltonian times our, our new wave function, which is the infinite series is going to be equal to all the energies times the infinite series of wave functions. Now you're like, all right, this just got a lot more complicated, all right? It went from like, four terms to infinite number of terms. <laughs> How is this helpful? What's helpful is the way we're able to simplify this because of the constraint. We know that for, for all lambda on the interval of zero to one, i.e. for when we're uh, in a reference state all the way to our perturbed uh, wave functions energies, that this must be true. So what we can do is from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, we know that for every power of lambda, the left-hand side must equal the right-hand side, since it has to be true for the entire series zero to one. So what's gonna happen is we can just look at that. Let's, let's set equal side, the side of the even the, each power of lambda. So for the zeroth power of lambda, i.e. which terms on the left-hand side won't have lambda in them, you can see that the unperturbed Hamiltonian, or the reference Hamiltonian, times the reference wave function is going to be the only term in this expansion. So when you multiply this binomial times this infinite series, that's going to be the only term that you end up getting back out that has uh, lambda to the zeroth power. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can also see that the uh, reference energies times the reference wave function is all you're going to get back out. So what we get from the, the zeroth order uh, equation is back to our reference uh, wave functions and energies, which we already have all the answers for. What becomes more important is what happens when we start collecting all the other lambda terms. Um, you can, you know, collect all these terms, multiply them out and look at them, you can quickly see that the only lambda term on the left-hand side is going to be the perturbation times the reference, and then the Hamiltonian times the perturbed wave function, which is what you see here, these two terms. And on the right, again, you're only going to have this term and the reference and then the energy with the uh, perturbed wave function. Uh, and you know, once you divide by lambda, this is the equations you get. So each equation I'm going to show, you're dividing back by all by lambda. So you do have the trivial solution of lambda zero, but you always get back to zero, so it's going to um, You can keep going, um, collecting terms, so on and so forth. And then you can generalize this to the kth order Schrodinger equations. So this whole set that we're going to generate is called the kth order uh, Schrodinger equations. And this is going to allow us to solve for things that we don't know, like the energy of the, um, uh, the kth, the, the, the higher order corrections to the energy and the higher order corrections to the wave functions uh, is what we're going to solve in just a second. But in general, you can write down the, the uh, kth order as such. You know that you can only get the terms of um, lambda to the k only ends up with two terms. And you can see from this series how it goes 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, backwards. So you can quickly see that it is a, just the sum of the energies to the, uh, for each of the, the excited uh, or perturbed wave functions. So how do we use this information? So we, we, so we have all these Schrodinger, um, uh, kth order Schrodinger equations. How do we get to better or more accurate energies? <clears throat> so first, let's, let's work our way up. So we'll start with zeroth order. Uh, energy correction. 
So we have this, but anytime I have these blue boxes, it's going to be something that I've either already derived or particularly from, from this screen right here. Okay. So the first one we're going to look at is uh, lambda zero. Um, so if we want to solve for en zero, so the, the, the reference energy, we're going to left multiply by um, the complex conjugate of the reference wave function. What we're going to end up getting is what we already knew of um, basically you get H I E side back. Um, but this is okay because this is all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors we already know. So this, this zeroth order is um, pretty straightforward. Uh, by the time we get to the first order energy correction, we're going to see that we already have um, uh, perturbed wave functions, but it's all right because of some orthogonality tricks that we're going to do. So how are we going to get um, the first order energy correction to, to survive? So to solve for this, Again, we're going to left multiply by the reference wave function. Again, uh, the complex conjugate of the reference wave function, sorry. Um, so you end up with the following uh, equation. And we don't know how to um, solve this yet because in Raleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory, we don't know what the perturbation is. So we're kind of, it's kind of generic right now. So in the end, we don't know how this one gets solved. Um, the Hamiltonian acting on, uh, is gonna, uh, on the wave function is going to end up with an energy. So it's going to have some kind of scalar. And we know that the uh, overlap of these two wave functions is going to give us zero. So that's going to, that term is going to be zero. This term is zero. And this is a scalar. We can pull it out. And the overlap of these is going to be one. So it's a, it's a uh, direct delta for the overlap of these uh, excited states. So <clears throat> what we have is the, the excited state energy correction for E1 is actually just the averaging of the perturbation over the unperturbed wave functions. So for just one, we don't even need the perturbed wave functions. And in general, we're going to see that for any energy to the k, we only need the perturbed wave function with k minus 1. We don't need the kth wave function. And this comes in helpful when we typically stop in MP2. So, uh, in the second order equation, um, we also see, um, I mean, we're just going to do the same thing. We want uh, E2 to survive, we're going to multiply the complex conjugate of the reference again and again. Uh, a lot of terms go to zero because of uh, 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 orthogonality. The thing that will survive will be um, a slightly more complicated term this time. So, I mean, you can follow each time we pull out constants, or and then we know uh, these terms go to zero. But what we're left with now is the second order equation depends on these perturbed wave functions. We don't know what these perturbed wave functions are yet. So we have to have a way of getting at these perturbed wave functions as well. Um, okay, we also have the kth order energy equations. Do the same type of iterative procedure of uh, just left multiplying. You know that the one you want is the kth one, so you always multiply by the complex conjugate of the reference, and you end up with um, you know the overlap of the reference with some side excited uh, some perturbed wave function. So how do we build these perturbed wave functions? Typically, we're going to build these out of um, a linear combination of our reference unperturbed wave functions. This is, I mean, you know, the theory doesn't restrict you to this, but it's very convenient, and you'll see why in just a second. And well, we already have, you know, uh, you already solved an SCF typically by this time, so you already have all the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of, of the reference. Um, but how, how do we know what these uh, coefficients are? So, you know, we have all these, um, you know, excitations. Uh, our excited states, but we don't know what the coefficients to sum them together are. So how do we solve for these? Uh, so the simplest equation to get at uh, the first order is what we'll look at. Um, what we'll do is we'll take lambda 1 and we'll multiply, we'll add in for what, we're, what we know is psi 1. So on the last slide we already said that uh, we can define psi 1 as this linear combination. Let's go ahead and just plug it in and expand it, and what we're left with is, is the second equation on the screen. From here, we can see that everything's written in terms of expansion coefficients and unperturbed wave functions. So we should be able to solve for things we know, everything we know except for these coefficients. Um, so indeed, again, um, we're going to multiply by the complex conjugate of our reference, and what we're going to get left with is um, well, some, we've got to pick one out. So we're going to multiply by not psi n, but uh, psi mu. Um, and what we're going to see here is, let's take a look at this, uh, this sum right here. 
we can see that the only term that's going to survive in the summation is when mu um, when mu is equal to nu. Okay, uh, so it's going to leave us with this term. Yeah, so this term here is going to go to here. So the only term that survived in that entire summation is uh, the coefficient mu with e mu uh, reference energy. Um, we don't, since it's generalized, we don't know how to solve this one yet. And this term should go to zero. No. This term, the only thing that's going to survive in this term again is going to be c nu uh, e n to the zero. So our reference energies. And then this term should go to zero because it has no overlap uh, or sort of bargain with each other. So what we're left with is two, two terms with C in it. We just collect terms and we can solve for C1. And so this term is slightly complicated because we don't know exactly how to solve for this. I mean, we have energy of the ground state, energy of these excited states. Um, and we're going to try to solve for those in just a second. But if we go ahead and plug that in, we can see that we can write the thing here is what we need to see is that we can write the perturbed wave functions in terms of all reference values. So in terms of uh, unperturbed wave functions and unperturbed energies. But what we're going to see in just a second is how we get at these unperturbed energies. These can be excited states of, uh, or these you know, different determinants that we've got to solve for. Um, so we'll, we'll get back to that in just one second. Uh, so how do we solve, uh, let's just get back to the harmonic oscillator and let's just look at how this really helped us. Um, in the end, let's say we just want to solve through first order of the ground state. Like I said, we can apply Raleigh Schrodinger to any state, but for now we're just going to look at the, the ground state. And to solve for the first order correction, we know what the perturbation is. We defined it as this cx cubed plus dx to the fourth. So we're just adding some complications to the potential. Um, and basically it's just substitution from here and some simple integrals or integrals you can look up easily. Um, you know the wave functions for the harmonic oscillators typically look like some normalization constant times e to the minus ax squared over 2. Um, and then we have our perturbation here. Uh, we know because of even odd functions, uh, these terms get dropped out. And because of even functions, we can simplify the integral from minus infinity to infinity to 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity. Uh, and this, this is very standard. You can look up in any appendix of any PCHEM book or math handbook. And you can, we can actually solve that the first order energy correction looks like this. Um, but this isn't the total energy. To get back to the total energy, we're going to actually sum the up to the orders that we have. So we know the zeroth order uh, is one half uh, h, bar, uh, h nu plus our first order energy correction. So even looking at this one, so we only solve through first order, so we're not actually incorporating everything, right? Because we truncated the series. You can actually see right here. I mean, we don't even have a C in there, right? So we already know that through first order, we don't have the whole picture just from looking at the numbers. I mean, we could set C to infinity or negative infinity, and this would completely change our potential. So you can already kind of see that sometimes you need to go further out in the series for certain applications. Uh, luckily for us, um, sometimes we don't have to go very far in electron structure theory. But for things like optics, you have to go out and cut it far. Okay, so for all of our... Uh, Raleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory, we never had any constraints on the Hamiltonian, uh, what we chose for our perturbation, our reference Hamiltonian, uh, no constraints. What Moller Plessit did, um, Moller and Plessit, um, is they said, all right, let's just make a convenient choice for our perturbation. And what they made for this choice, uh, commonly referred to as a fluctuation potential, is the difference between, let's assume that we had a two particle operator versus or the difference between the two particle operator and the one particle operator. So we have um, the Rij term uh, compared to the one particle operator that we saw in hartree fock So this is the, 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 the term in hartree fock where we kind of just take one electron and make it see the field of everything else, the main field of all the n minus one electrons around it. Uh, so basically this difference is the instantaneous electron interaction that is going to fill. Uh, just some quick notation that we're going to be working in physics, uh, physicist notation for the rest of these times. Uh, so electron 1 will have indices IK and electron 2 will have JL. 
So, in multiplex perturbation theory, our H0 is actually just going to be the Fock, uh, Fock operator, which is going to be our four Hamiltonian plus this uh, one electron Hartree Fock potential we just talked about. And if you plug that back in, uh, what we get for H0, uh, okay, so we have it here, uh, is just the sum of the orbital energies. Uh, a lot of people, you know, the first time you study perturbation theory, you think E0 should be the Hartree Fock energy. Uh, but we can definitely see it's not the Hartree Fock energy, it's just the sum of the orbital energies. And basically, you're just double counting. Um, but it, I mean, it, yeah, it's just not the Hartree Fock energy because you're double counting. In Hartree Fock theory, whenever you're summing um, uh, these one electron potentials, every time you have an electron, you look at how it looks to all the other n minus one electrons. So by the time you get to another one, it's all the other n minus one electrons, but since they're pairs, you're double counting. So that's why it's not, not that, but y'all already said that in the ACF lecture. So, um, so let's look at the, the first order perturbation, uh, our first order corrections of energy, which should get us back to the, the SCF. What we're gonna look at is, uh, we know that our potential is the difference between the two particle uh, operator and the one particle uh, operator. And, um, we can kind of see, you know, how this um, how this gets back to our SCF. For our first order, is basically just um, getting rid of this double counting that we had in SCF. Um, but once again, uh, the total energy is still the sum of the, first, the sum of the two. Um, so by the time we want to get to the second order, like I said, it gets a lot more complicated because we have these first order um, perturbed wave functions we have to handle. So we already saw for it from Raleigh Schrodinger what those look like, but we don't know how that really applies to electron structure theory yet. Excuse me. Um, so just substituting in, we can kind of see um, what we're left with for ground state. So, so here's the general equation for all, all energy. So for most all very excited to say anything. We have the general equation of, of um, this guy. But let's focus, let's just simplify it for a second for discussion's sake. Let's, let's look at just the ground state. So we know that the energy of the ground state, the second order, we're gonna sum over all excitations, right? So the, the overlap of the excitation with the, uh, with the perturbation acting on some excited state but we don't know which excitations um, are gonna survive. So we've we got two complicated terms. We have all these uh, uh, determinants that we get to add in, and we have all the energies of those determinants that we have to add in, but this series, um, we don't know which ones survive. But we have some easy rules to know which, uh, which ones survive. Um, from CI theory, uh, or the CI talk, y'all learned about Brouillon's theorem. We know that all the singly excited determinants that we see cannot directly interact with a reference, okay? So all the singles are gone. Um, the doubles, the doubles are gonna survive. We'll talk about that in just a second, how we're gonna evaluate each one of those. Uh, the triples, we also know are zero because the perturbation, the Rij is a two particle um, operator, so anything that has three excitations should not contribute to either. So given these two, we can greatly simplify um, our equation to looking at double excitations. So which excitations, um, so which chi's, uh, which sets of double excitations, um, are one, how many are there, and how do we restrict it such that we can sum over all unique ones? Um, again, from CI theory, we, all, we already have this answer for us of um, basically taking all the occupied, so if we, look, if we call occupied, you know, A, B, C, and then um, all the virtual space RS, we can take any unique pairs of exciting ABs into RS. And then what we can look at is um, taking the overlap with, the, with our uh, two particle, two particle um, perturbation, um, the overlap of the reference with this excited determinant, okay? We already, we already know what this roughly looks like, like um, from uh, from SCF, uh, from, um, is it on the other side? We already know how to evaluate these terms in terms of uh, J's and K's, uh, or from um, 
Coulomb exchange intervals. Um, but we also don't know what the energy of those excited determinants are. So when we act uh, the Hamiltonian on these excited uh, determinants, we get it's easier to do it from some reference. So instead of calculating the complete energy, we can say we do know that it's the energy of the original, um, the energy of the reference with the delta of the orbitals. So we just look at the changes in, let's say we, we took it out of one orbital, put it in the next, we just look at the change in energy from going from one to the other. So this is the difference from going uh, the orbital energy of A to orbital energy of R. So basically we're going from A to R, which you see in here, and then we're going to go from B to S, B to S, and then the sum is going to take care, or this sum is going to take care of all unique pairs of those. So if we substitute in um, these two, we're left with what we typically look like, more like MP2 equation. Um, that's a lot easier to program. Um, one other note that we have for these equations is that um, we have to do this in the molecular orbital basis as opposed to um, um, atomic, atomic orbital basis. <laughs> atomic orbital basis sorry. Uh, so typically you can look at this and it only looks like an end of the fourth operation, but the problem is, is getting these two electron integrals into a molecular orbital basis is an end of the fifth process because you need to multiply by the coefficients uh, multiple times. Oh, you got to convert them. So, so yeah, so this is what the second order looks like. You could generalize this to third, fourth order, fifth order, um, and you know get more and more accurate energies, but as we're about to see in uh, perturbation theory, we necessarily don't get better energies for a lot of reasons, so that's what I'd like to talk about. Now, the first one to talk about what it gets right before we talk about what it gets wrong. Um, this is the argon-dimer interaction energy. Um, uh, this is couple clusters, oh, so we got all of them. The blue one is uh, print T, green is MP2, and red is CCSD. And if you were to apply SCF, I couldn't grab my data in time. If you were to apply SCF, it would show no binding for this. Uh, completely repulsive uh, because of these averaging out. So you don't have this instantaneous electron-electron uh, interaction. Uh, but what you can see is it actually does get uh, a lot of this information right. It overbinds, but it's a lot better than showing it repulsive with SCF. Would do. So let's, let's look at some things um, a little bit more complicated that aren't as easy as uh, just dispersion bound complexes. Let's look at uh, H2 bond breaking. If you look at H2 bond breaking, uh, we start to see the problems that it has with degeneracies or multi-reference problems uh, in breaking H2. The top left, we kind of show you the uh, uh, S squared expectation value. So we can see it go from a singlet. So in this region, it's going to be a singlet. Uh, and in this area, it's going to go to a triplet. Okay, so you can see that are, uh, these scales are different. So one's anchor, one's bore. If you're wondering why it doesn't really match up too well, it, it does work out where it, it happens roughly at the right spot. Uh, you can see that as soon as it goes multi-reference, or as soon as it starts to have mixing of uh, singlet and triplet character, um, perturbation theory starts to break down. And actually, it will break down for pretty much any level of theory where you start to have small uh, homolumo gaps. So anytime you excite from uh, you know, these orbitals and they're really close in energy, uh, particularly because of this term, right? If you excite, if these two energy levels are right beside each other, so n and n plus 1 are right beside each other, this it goes to infinity, right? So, and as you get to MP, as you get to these higher order corrections, you start to have higher uh, uh, powers associated with these things, and the infinities blow up even faster. So anytime you go, uh, if you have these mixing of various determinants, you can see that perturbation theory is going to break down. And, and actually, you can see Hartree-Fock theory doesn't even really get it right either, because it sticks to one reference as well. But at least it doesn't, it doesn't blow up. I mean, it, it gives you the wrong answer, but it doesn't blow up and give you infinite numbers. Um, so you also think, okay, well maybe we just keep going higher in um, the series. A lot of people for a while, you know, thought these series would converge. Um, this is water, so I didn't include this. This is water for the MPN series with CCPVD basis at its uh, equilibrium geometry. 
And you know, for well-behaved systems, if you two, if you three, or three, four, five, uh, you see this is the error with respect to uh, the correlation error with respect to full CI, I believe. I have to check. Do you remember off the top of your head? Mm, that's probably what it is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. I just don't know. Uh, so you can see that for well-behaved systems, uh, indeed, the system does converge, and it converges rather quickly. Um, but even by the time you're out to MP5, the complexity of perturbation theory is already past a couple cluster, um, so it really doesn't help you too much, even even when it does converge. Uh, but as you can see, for when you start to extend this, uh, extend the bonds for these things, you can see very erratic behavior in perturbation theory, going. Uh, back to infinities for all these things. Um, and that's all. Thanks very much. Question? Comments? I think this was a very nice overview of the basics of what go in perturbation theory. Probably to talk about it in any more detail than this would require diagrams, which is a topic of a different topic. So, yeah. um, Let me suggest to everybody, if you haven't ever done this before, uh, I bet, I'm sure Sahan's done this before, maybe some of the rest of you have. If you haven't ever done it before, it's a nice exercise to take the rayleigh Schrodinger derivation that Sean did and then just kind of plug in um, what happens if Brillouin's theorem doesn't hold? Well, if you don't have Hartree Fock orbitals. And then you get some singles looking term. And then you get a little bit of practice of working out what those would be. They're not very hard at all. Um, and then you can get the non Hartree Fock MP2 equations, which are useful to have around uh, for things like dual basis MP2 and whatever, a couple of interesting things. That's been coded up in Psi at least once, uh, probably more than once. I was told Psi had arbitrary order. Yes. So you can take if you can take your generalized kth order equations and implement them with a full CI code pretty easily. So my CI program has been adapted to gener to generate MPN through any order n. Now, if you asked it for n equals a million, it's not going to work because there'd be round off errors that accumulate. Mm -hmm. But we've published uh, results up to about MP 150 or so. And um, generally speaking, you see things like you were showing where sometimes it converges really well, but other times, if you have diffuse functions or various other problems or bond stretches, you can get. Divergence, you can get ringing patterns where it converges and diverges and converges again and diverges. You get all sorts of crazy looking. Yeah, patterns. the other half of that graph is they do the odd sets and you see it go yep. crazy. Yep. So that's um, one of the unique features of the code in size that you can do these molar plus calculations through any order. Now, because you're using a full CI code, you more or less have to be able to afford a full CI to be able to do this arbitrary or uh, arbitrary or perturbation theory, but you know, for small, for small molecules with small basis sets, you have 10 electrons or less or whatever, you, you know, it's totally fine. Any other comments or questions? All right, well, if not, thanks very much. <laughs>